الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف خلق الله محمد وآله الطاهرين السلام عليكم brothers and sisters and inshallah uh, by now you would probably have come to realize the uh, importance of making that decision and this kind of decision which will be a life-changing decision for a person. Studying in the Hawza is in no way easy and therefore you need to be mentally prepared for all of this. But the satisfaction is that you are able to become acquainted with the most important of issues in this world and that is you will gain two wings and these two wings you are going to be able to use and you will have to use all the time until you depart this world and you will also be sharing the fruits of these two wings until you depart this world as well and that is the Quran and the Sunnah. Everything that you do in Al Hawz Al Almiya is for the purpose of strengthening these two wings the Quran and the Sunnah. You are going to have to go through so many Arabic principles and Arabic laws and grammatic rules. You're going to go through years of studying of Ilmul Nahu and Balagha and Sarf, Arabic literature. And it's a very dry subject. You know, a lot of people don't, I wouldn't say, sorry, I should not say a lot of people, but, you know, there are people like me who don't like, never liked Ilmul Nahu. But there is going to be an emphasis on this in your study curriculum for a purpose. And that is for you to grasp onto the depth of the language of the Quran and Sunnah. And so when you enter into the Hawza and you have mastered these two sides of the uh, weights you know, we know الثقلين and, and, and the famous hadith of كتاب الله وعترتي أهل بيتي. You know, these two wings of the Quran and the Sunnah. And everything that you studied was for this purpose. You studied علم النحو for the Quran and Sunnah. You studied fiqh for the Quran and Sunnah. You studied uh, logic and philosophy and علوم عقلية, rational sciences for the Qur'an and Sunnah. You studied tafsir, obviously, for the Qur'an and Sunnah. And anything else that you are going to go through, the main objective that you have is to familiarize yourself, first of all, with these two wings and strengthen them and also to allow others to become familiarized with it through you as a medium and that's why it's very important to uh, remember that um, with these two wings you will be able to acquire religious basira you will have an insight into what religion is and to find the core precepts of what uh, Ahlul Bayt side of Islam truly represents. Now, when a person has these two wings and they feel that they are now being able to grasp onto the foundations, the core elements of Al Quran Al Sunnah, and they're realizing that their insight, their basira, is uh, strengthening and strengthening that's also going to make them fall down as far as their um, ego is concerned. But that can only happen if a person uh, brings p 
parallel to all of this, that strictness in their self-disciplining. And this is something that I've mentioned more than once, where from the very beginning of a person's uh, Hauzawi life, they are strictly involved in self-purification and self-discipline. And that's why the second point here, and this is something that has been mentioned by a great alim, number one, the wings of Qur'an and Sunnah needs to be uh, an, a fundamental part of the Hawza student's life and everything that he or she does needs to feed uh, these two wings. And number two, never to succumb ourselves to the dunya or to dunyawi matters. That whatever we do, wherever we go, we always remember that it is for al-akhirah. If it's something that is going to benefit my akhirah, then I will pursue it. But if it is something that will not benefit my akhirah, then I want to stay away from it. You know, and that's always why we are going to have a problem with, you know, um, this kind of, if I could say, field or industry. Because, you know, as ulama al akhlaq have said, ilm can become al hijab al akbar, the greatest veil. Why? Because maybe through ilm a person might want to pursue fame or power and um, want to promote their name and uh, insist on making sure that um, their name uh, supersedes anyone else. You know, um, don't refer to me by my name only, but you need to always uh, remember that you have to mention my titles, not only my title, you know, Hazrat Ayatollah or Samahat al Alama, a Sayyid, a Sheikh, Hujjat al Islam, wal Muslimin. And uh, if someone was to say a Sheikh and not say Ayatollah, a Sheikh, a Sayyid, or if someone was to say al Sheikh and not say a Sheikh al Doctor, you know, or if someone was to not stand up in respect for them or open up the path for uh, him to enter, you know, they would feel that this is the greatest insult that has ever occurred. Now, I don't mean that, you know, you start walking around and you test people by saying, uh, well, yeah, Zaid, how are you? What are you doing today? Uh, no, of course, you need to uh, respect people and by their titles and um, it's also something very very recommended you know uh, we have many riwayat from Ahlul Bayt السلام, that speak about the recommendation of referring to people by their kunya you know not saying Zaid but saying Abu Ibrahim you know um, so these things do have some kind of etiquette side and common courtesy and things like that. But for a per person to be adamant about it and for um, me to feel that this is the greatest insult that has ever occurred in the Muslim Ummah by me um, not being referred to by, this is a kind of way of polluting our souls and it will indeed if affect that level of ikhlas and sincerity that we need to have. You know, ultimately I'm doing this for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whether I get some kind of praising or um, commending from the people is completely irrelevant. You know, I am my own person and alhamdulillah you need to be that person who needs to have that level of courage, that level of independence. You know, you're not being fed by uh, this particular community or this particular group or this particular 
mm, businessman in order for you to you know try to keep up to their standards and you know you want to make sure that um, you uh, are uh, molded or you say things that would keep them aligned with you or keep yourself aligned with them you know and that's where politics and these kind of things get involved and it becomes very very ugly and that's what is meant by this second point being dunya and succumbing to um, dunyawi matters which indeed will um, pollute uh, one's soul a third important point um, is that when a person does get involved with their studies with your studies and you enter into the Hausa system you're going to have a lot of free time in the sense that there is nobody on top of you screaming down your throat saying things and reminding you hey study stop wasting your time stop sleeping excessively uh, why haven't you prepared yourself for your uh, lesson why haven't you prepared yourself for your mubahatha and all these other things um, you need to be your own self and you uh, you need to make sure that you monitor yourself as far as your progress in studying is concerned and that's why occupying yourself with studying and researching and teaching is very very important now I use the word mubahatha so I of course have to make sure that I clarify that in the traditional kind of uh, Hausa study methodology uh, the lesson is the dars itself is the main central focus of the student however there are things that need to be done before that and there are things that need to be done after that what is done before that is pre lesson preparation and that means when you have a particular book that you are studying you need to make sure that you know you know that you're on page 147 you need to make sure that you've mastered whatever it is before and you are preparing yourself for the next lesson so when you enter into the next lesson you know even roughly vaguely what's going on of course the ustad is going to give you the correct information and you are going to be able to comprehend better but it's better than you entering into the next lesson and having absolutely no idea what is to come ahead so that's why it's very important for you before entering into the dars for you to be ready and prepared now I said that the, the main central focus is going to be the dars itself the lesson itself you prepare for the dars you're sitting in the dars well I'm not going to be talking about choosing a teacher at the moment I'll do that in another session but you're preparing for your dars and um, now you're entering into the classroom you're sitting in the presence of your ustad um, you've made sure also as I've mentioned all the time your, your, the par your parallel to your uh, knowledge seeking and everything else is your spiritual purification you never enter into a dars without wudu so you've done your wudu you've made sure that you've purified your your intention you're doing this in service of Imam al-Mahdi ajallallahu ta'ala farajuhu sharif you see yourself as one of the disciples one of the soldiers one of the students of sahib al-asri was zaman ajallallahu ta'ala farajuhu sharif and therefore you're, do, you're doing that with a lot of strong motivation coming into the dars on time always making sure that you're there before your ustad the Ustad is going to give you, I would say, let's roughly 40% of the main substance of your dars, right? You've acquired about 5 to 10%. Your teacher is going to give you about 40%. What's left now after that is 
another 50%. That other 50% is, of course, while you're studying, you're going to be writing down notes and explanations and um, issues uh, or question marks that you have on the side of your text. These are called the um, margins, right? And that's why they call it the hashia and um, the marginal notes or the marginal glosses that you are going to be writing. Of course, this is something that has been an, a, a, an, a, a custom for all this time as in Hausa students. If you see all of these uh, manuscript books of our uh, ulama and even until now, you know, you see a lot of uh, side notes that are written here on the margins. We could call them footnotes or what not, marginal notes. And that's very, very important um, as well. The second 50%, um, which is after your lesson, is divided into two things. Number one is your um, further reading as far as looking at the shuruh, the commentaries, the uh, explanatory notes for this particular textbook that you're studying and also the mubahatha and the mubahatha is uh, a discussion a post dars discussion which means you have chosen uh, and agreed with one of your fellow classmates it could be one person it could be two people it could be five people that you are going to uh, sit down and discuss the uh, lesson that was studied that day. And this could rotate. Uh, you prepare the, the Mubahatha session one day, your fellow uh, classmate prepares, or your fellow Musahaba mate prepares the um, explanation of the dars the next day. And so when you've left your class and you've uh, gone back to your um, dormitory or you've gone back to your home and you've read the shuruh, you are now able to present it to your classmates. So when you have gone through the commentaries and the shuruh and the explanatory notes and then you're uh, ready for the uh, mubahatha and um, I think I've, men I've mentioned the word musahaba instead of mubahatha. Musahaba means interview. What I mean is mubahatha. So uh, you're preparing yourself for the mubahatha. And uh, you're going to be able to uh, not only master that text that you have studied that day, but you're, you're also learning the skill of delivery and teaching. And you have a critique right there in, in front of you uh, who is going to be uh, with their open eyes and their open ears, they're going to be making sure that they are paying the utmost level of attention for them to be able to critique you and say, no, well, you, you the vamir that you just mentioned doesn't go to this word, it goes to that word. That's not what the teacher said. That's not what um, the Martin, the main text said, and by the way, the Sharah, one of the commentaries that you ha did not mention, says this as a, as a co co correct um, explanation. And that's, you know, the benefit of the Mubahatha, not the Musahaba, the Mubahatha. So 10%, uh, 40%, 50%. 50%. That 50% is divided into your uh, preparation and then the rest is the mubahatha and then it, you rotate the exact same thing uh, the next day so you uh, delivered the mubahatha lesson today uh, your hambas your uh, fellow mubahith is going to be delivering it the next day and you're going to uh, be learning and gaining experience as far as delivering a class and everything else and so is the other person and that's why it's a, a custom in the Hausa that once you finish studying one book you should be 
so confident in having mastered this uh, particular book that you are able, once you finish it, you are able to teach that same book. Of course, at a lower level, and you teach it again, and then you teach it again, then you teach it again, until you know you uh, yourself become a person with your own view or your own opinion about this particular ilm. And that's exactly the very process as to how our ulama um, went through their uh, study years. Anyway, that was the third thing, occupying yourself with uh, studying and researching and teaching. And mubahatha itself is a part of this teaching process that you uh, need to expose yourself to. There is a fourth point, and that is um, what kind of methodology do we need to use with sharing this information, sharing this knowledge. You know, zakat, as the hadith says, zakatul ilm nashrah. The zakat of knowledge is sharing it and propagating it, but I'm going to leave that for another session. Walhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. والصلاة والسلام على أشرف خلق الله محمد وآله الطاهرين.